Uh, I'm now really delighted to introduce Duncan Wilson. Um, he's chief executive of Historic England, and as, as most of you will know, in fact, he's the first chief executive of Historic England. He uh, took over the organisation fairly recently, and we're looking forward very much to hearing what he has to say. Duncan. Thank you, Ros, uh, and thank you, of course, to the Prince's Regeneration Trust, Heritage Lottery Fund, and indeed our hosts here at the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester, because I think it just indicates what we can do when we work together, um, which is something we certainly want to encourage as historic England. Uh, I have a program of 70 slides. If I talked to them, we, I'd either deliver the fastest lecture on living record or we'd be here till about two o'clock before I hand it over. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, I did think at one point whether I should ask people to uh, uh, let us know which, which sites they thought they were and offer a small prize for the person who got them all right. But that would be such a distraction from my words of wisdom that nobody would listen to a word I was saying. So I'm not going to do that. However, you will note that there are some clues in my speech and one or two of the places that appear on the screen are mentioned in the speech, hopefully. Um, we're going to celebrate successes in the next two days. Um, a broad range of successes from smaller projects to regionally, nationally, and internationally significant projects. And look in detail at them. Most importantly, learn from them. But that isn't to say there are, also, there are not also a huge number of challenges in the sector of reuse of industrial buildings, and we have to recognize that. Um, we will learn something about um, projects outside the UK, and I think that's really important. Um, but of course, in saying that, I think I would be wrong not to uh, wave the Union Jack for a brief moment, because Britain was the f world's first industrial nation. And the legacy of that is all around us and is a, is a legacy for everyone, everyone on the planet. Collectively, what we have here in the UK is of great international importance. And that's reflected in the fact that nine of our 29 World Heritage Sites are industrial in nature. There are some 600 preserved industrial sites across England accessible to the public. I'm not quite sure whether in the light of recent news, that number is rising or falling, but there are still a, a large number of such sites. And uh, we know that um, industrial heritage is, is very popular. Um, from a poll in 2011, 83% of people thought it was important that we valued and appreciated our industrial heritage. And 71% believed that our industrial sites should be our industrial heritage sites should be reused for modern day purposes. But actually more important than those statistics is, is, is the uh, intuitive knowledge that we all share in this room that these places are immensely important to our national and regional identity. And although finding new uses for them can occasionally be very challenging, we need to give it our best shot. Of course, industrial heritage is not always in locations where reuse is possible, uh, and it's not getting any easier. Some sites are just not capable of reuse, and occasionally we have to take some very difficult decisions about them. We have made some progress, and um, Historic England's Heritage at Risk Register, with which you may be familiar, still, however, contains 340 grade one and two star entries um, in relation to industrial sites, illustrating the scale of the challenge. Our industrial heritage at risk project in 2011 showed that industrial buildings were more at risk than almost any other kind of heritage. It found that almost 11% of grade one and two star industrial buildings were at risk which is a very high number relative to other categories, 3% uh, being the, the average rate of numbers of buildings at one and two star that are at risk across the whole of England. 
But it's not all doom and gloom. The survey showed that some 40% of industrial heritage buildings which were listed, such as mills, warehouses and factories, could be put into sustainable and economic new uses. So what do we see historic England's role as being? Well, we, we see our, ourselves primarily as facilitators. We don't have a huge grant budget anymore, but we can intervene early, use our powers of persuasion, use our research to indicate to owners, whether they are public or private, the range of solutions which might well be available. And we can, using our relatively small grant programs, occasionally keep buildings on life support while the right solution arises. Um, and that is really important because we can intervene relatively quickly in such circumstances. We engage with our industrial heritage through uh, a number of initiatives. There's our Heritage at Risk program, which I've already mentioned, um, Heritage Angels, which is a way of, 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 pop, of uh, publicizing um, the, the amazingly valuable work that building preservation trusts individuals are doing to uh, keep the flame alive in respect to particular buildings and places. Uh, and often that work is unsung. This is uh, an attempt to make it more well known. Um, we espouse the principles of constructive conservation. We are um, prepared to look at imaginative solutions, even when we may lose some of the original, to create a, a sustainable way forward. And of course, we, we uh, manage the nation's program of listing which, which uh, is, is a, a formal statutory recognition of the significance of, of buildings and places. We undertake research, and some of that you'll see reflected in our publications outside. And our guidance document, um, Heritage Works uh, for Industrial Buildings, uh, indicates some specific work we've done in this area. So, just talking about some of the projects we've been specifically involved with. Um, perhaps one of the ones I remember best um, from my early career at English Heritage, as it then was, Dean Clough Mills, Halifax, one of the first examples of adaptive reuse of a huge industrial site by a, a developer and patron with an extraordinary determination and vis vision and is, it's now a, an arts, um, business, design, and educational complex, and very successful. Birmingham Jewelry Quarter, um, a very different sort of project. Um, recently, I mentioned the Angels Awards. N Newman Brothers Coffin Works in the Jewelry Quarter won an Angel Award. Um, extraordinary place, surviving with all its, its fittings and equipment, uh, much as... as uh, uh, the um, silver plating works, which we, we took on previously, did. Um, our research teams got in early to the jewellery quarter and provided an authoritative assessment of character and significance of the area and detailed reports on many buildings which helped to inform design and later conversion. Um, so we helped by setting out which particular parts of the building we felt were most significant, allowing developers and owners to, to work on solutions which they felt would be likely to meet with approval and would help with long-term sustainability. Leeds Holbeck, uh, where uh, a large complex of industrial buildings uh, combined with new development to create a, a sense of place drawing on the earlier character, industrial character, uh, the design of the new buildings reflecting that character and sitting very comfortably alongside the historic elements of the site. That brought people who live and work in the area together and created a vibrant new area of Leeds. Cooper Studios, Newcastle, where I think there's an extraordinary story. Um, I've actually been able to go round, uh, although the building is now... Is now fully in use as an architect studio, um, where we had to take some, some fairly far-reaching decisions about um, creating openings in the external 
fabric of the building to allow light in, but that really was the key to unlocking its potential. Uh, Cooper's was a horse and carriage auction rooms uh, with a ground floor ring uh, on which horses were paraded and a first floor gallery for ladies to see the horses because they weren't supposed to be quite so close to horse flesh, um, which then was converted into a motor car showroom. Uh, I think by that stage, women were allowed to see the motor cars close up. Um, but it is an extraordinary piece of social history as well as a piece of industrial and commercial history and now successfully converted to office use. Stanley Dock, Liverpool, where the Titanic Hotel um, is in the vanguard of stimulating a whole new area uh, of growth. Um, and that illustrates another generic point, which is often conversion and successful reuse of an industrial building can lead the way for the private sector to come in and regenerate the surrounding area. Um, we've been working proactively with, with Network Rail on Midland Rail electrification. The point I'd like to make in that context is industrial heritage is not just about enormous mill buildings or factories. It is about bridges and viaducts and signal boxes and taking a holistic approach to that over the whole of a, of a railway line has allowed us to, to work with the owner, Network Rail, in, in more or less consensually prioritizing the significance of those structures and then being able to work around them. And finally, I couldn't mention industrial heritage without talking about our own particular cuckoo in the nest, Ditherington Flax Mill, a huge challenge where Historic England um, took on the role of owner of last resort for a really m in important, internationally significant building, the first example of, of iron-framed construction on this scale as early as the last decade of the 18th century. Um, and we felt that this building was so important that we had to intervene directly. Very unusual, but occasionally that's what we do. Uh, and we are looking, with, with recent, uh, uh, recently opening the first phase of regeneration of that site with a new visitor centre, uh, we are looking to develop a, a comprehensive master plan talking to the HLF about its long-term future. Um, actually, I said finally, there is one more I should mention, which is Battersea Power Station, which just goes to indicate that sometimes it's not just about location, it is about the challenge of the building itself. And um, I, I think we're all delighted that a solution has been found which keeps the, the power station more or less intact after many, many years. So the lessons we learn about our involvement in, in industrial heritage sites is that the earlier we get involved, the better. Um, we will help to provide innovative solutions based on authoritative research, which is the absolute key, because if you don't know what you've got, you can't respect it as, as is required in terms of new design. Um, we can now offer a new service for major developments, uh, which we've called enhanced advisory services, where the developer can put in a very modest amount of money to make sure that research is done on a timely basis and feeds into the design process very early on. Uh, we are looking, despite constrained resources, to, to develop our own ways of working, uh, not just building on the successful um, her Heritage at Risk program where we prioritize individual buildings, but we're looking to launch, um, we're looking at, still at the feasibility, but we're looking to launch a, a new concept of heritage action zones where we partner with local authorities and others uh, to raise the profile of restoration of particular areas, which will no doubt include industrial areas. Um, but if I was asked to, um, to list the essential ingredients for a success successful industrial regeneration refurbishment project, um, I think I'd end with this. You need, of course, an extraordinary building I mean, that is always the starting point, an inspirational place. Um, you need a champion. That champion needs to stick with the project through thick and thin, often for very many years, and can be a, 
a building preservation trust, an individual or an owner, you need capital or an investor, whether that comes from the Heritage Lottery Fund or a private investor, but it will take significant amounts of money and a commercial vision to match the, the vision of the identity of the building. And of course you need a sustainable future because without that you are just deferring the problem. But maybe I could leave you with those, those thoughts to inform our consideration of some of the projects later on. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Duncan. And I think, you know, many of us would agree that the support and uh, not just funding, but actually the general support that Historic England has given um, over the years to projects has been absolutely critical in saving much of our industrial heritage. I was only speaking to somebody this morning who was en route to saving something and could not have done it without the support that Historic England is providing. So uh, many thanks for that. I'm glad you didn't test us on the buildings. I got Middleport Pottery, if I could get, <laughs> well, I could get some marks for that one. <laughs> and one or two others that had names on it, but um, I'm not sure I would have been the, uh, the star on the quiz. Um, 